Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and I'm the Dean of Graduate Studies at Charles Darwin University, and welcome to Outrider 34, Excuse Culture. Let me tell you how we got here. I was conducting one of my regular meetings with our overtime students, the students that have taken a long time and their candidature has blown out with regard to time. But no worries, what I do is I sit with the students and we come up with some positive solutions and some strategies to complete this PhD. But in this particular meeting, every strategy I offered, every statement of a way to finish the thesis was battered back. So I'd suggest one strategy to make it work and then magically an excuse would appear. And this continued for 35 minutes. Here's a strategy, here's an excuse back. And that was the conversation. Now, what these excuses did is they blocked this student thinking about herself her actions, her behaviour, and also her accountability for her life. In an office like mine, in an inbox, an email inbox like mine, excuses are the marinade of my daily life. I live in an excuse culture. And there are reasons for that. Excuses are completely rational and completely logical in a higher degree program because it's very, very painful to look at our current situation, to look at who we are and where we are and state, you know what, the behaviours, the actions, the patterns that I have configured have created my current situation. That's very hard knowledge and it's very painful knowledge and excuses are a mechanism, a way to block that pain, even for a little while. Because it's much easier to provide feedba feedback for people who are not asking for it. So invariably when I'm wanting to talk about the student and their PhD, they're offering me feedback about other things and other people. It's easier to blame others. So much easier to blame others than to sit in the fear and the worry and the concern and the self-actualisation and reflection required to finish a task. But excuses are the enemy of success. Excuses are the enemy of achievement. Excuses are the enemy of transparency and accountability. Excuses are also reactive rather than proactive. Therefore, what I want to do today between all of us is discuss the consequences of an excuse culture on a doctoral program. And we're doing this for many reasons. We're reaching sort of the end of the calendar year, so we're moving into Christmas, and it's important that we reflect on who we are and what we've done to enable a reboot and a refashioning in the new year. So what we're going to talk about today are the key accountabilities. We're going to talk about what we have control over as humans, as researchers. And I begin with two questions for you. The first question, how are your excuses serving you? How are your excuses serving you? And the second question, what are you achieving through those excuses? Hard questions, I know. So often, excuses are blockages, blockages in the completion of a thesis. And what's happening is you've got a wall of excuses that you've created, and it's blocking the heat and the light and the transformation. Now, I wondered if this was a thing. So I put PhD excuses, PhD student excuses, into Google. And 167,500 returns came in response to that prompt. So this is clearly a thing. And there's even a business on Etsy, there's even a business that produces a T-shirt with the slogan, excuses won't get you a PhD. Okay, so PhD candidate tours are excuse heavy environments. It is tough to complete a PhD. There's no doubt about that. It is a tough 
tough space. And I respect you for having a good go. But the students who finish are self-contained, self-directed, and they're motivated. In a PhD, very often, you've got a sense that I've got no control over what's going on here, that all the power <laughs> has been sucked out of your life. I understand that. But that's actually not true. It's not the case. Yes, you do have to work within the parameters of policies and procedures and regulations. You have to work within the parameters of supervisory expectations, but also, most importantly, examiner standards. But it is important that you don't relinquish power and you control what you can control. You have control over how you think, how you speak, and how you act. You have control over the work that you do on your PhD every day. It is your PhD. I know it's a cliche, but it is your PhD. It's your name on the certificate. So why are you relinquishing power? Why are you relinquishing power to other people? Which is what excuses and an excuse culture does. Control what you can control. Yes, if you need to have a grumble bum, have a grumble bum. If you need to howl at the moon, knock yourself out. There are plenty of dreadful supervisors on this planet. There is no doubt about that. Appalling advisors, appalling supervisors, no argument for me at all. They are exploitative, they are nasty, they are disrespectful, absolutely. And you know what? Research projects go wrong all the time. We run out of resources, the materials that we thought would be available, they're just not available. This is what research is. And of course, friends and partners and families complain about how much time we're spending on that PhD because research is an immersive life. I understand that. I think, oh, I'm just going to do a few minutes on this project and like six hours later, okay? So our, our friends, our people around us complain about the immersive nature of a research life. I understand that and they're right to complain. But, but... Remember that it is a privilege to do a PhD. It is a privilege to have this opportunity. So few people on planet Earth even have the opportunity to enrol, and you've been given that opportunity. Now, if a PhD was easy, everybody would have one. It's not easy, that's the point. This is a tough degree. 1% of the world's population have completed a PhD. This is tough. This is a tough gig. But complaints and excuses will not complete this degree. But courage and determination will complete this degree. Excuses also stop you, stop us all, from making good decisions. We need to recognise bad stuff happens to amazing people. That's true. But we know who we are as a human being, not by how we handle the good times. When things are great, <laughs> life is easy to handle. Life is beautiful. Life is terrific. But we know what sort of person we are and others are when the worst happens. So when really dreadful stuff happens to you, are you able to show dignity? and respect and integrity and compassion? Or do you, do we lash out and drag other people down with us and summon a plethora of excuses that make everything worse for everybody? Dreadful stuff happens to great people, full stop. And those great people don't blame or shame or ridicule or summon excuses but continue to try and help others. So ask yourself, this is tough stuff today, I know, but ask yourself, what sort of person are you when bad stuff happens to you? Do you make excuses or do you reach out and care for others?
So this outrider works from a couple of premises or maxims today. Excuses do not serve you. And excuses do not serve your PhD. The key is to ensure every day, every minute of every day, that your behaviour, your actions and your words make you feel centred and safe and on the pathway to complete your PhD. So if you're one of those people, and let's be honest, every single one of us does this, that you get sort of trapped or lost in your own excuses. You blame other people endlessly for your failures, for your inability to complete a task. The question is, how do you get out of that? We all do it, so how do we get out of it? And what I want to do is configure five solutions to move you to a post blame culture, move you outside of an excuse culture today. So I'm offering you five strategies today that will enable you to make different choices. Let's do it. One, give yourself one goal that you can achieve today. Excuses create blockages. They stop you from moving. So the first stage to get out of this excuse culture, to get out of this blame culture, is to tonight plan one job that you will complete tomorrow. Now this is a very specific bespoke kind of job. You need to make it small, you need to make it containable, and this job or task or goal must not be reliant on anybody else. So start the task, finish the task, congratulate yourself for completing that task. Remind yourself, this is so important, remind yourself about what you have control over. Then give yourself a task and then another task and then another task and finish each of those tasks because you have control over them, you have control over yourself, you have control over your time. Gabrielle Masharat confirmed that, quote, we are in charge of how we feel. We are in charge of how we respond in our environment. Therefore, select one goal and complete it. And that will therefore block the justifications, the excuses, the errors, the procrastination, the fear, the laziness. Two, stop excuses before you speak them. Crucial intervention, this one. Every time you feel yourself summoning an excuse, stop it at your lips. Stop yourself. Stop yourself vocalising your disappointments onto other people. Focus on yourself and look in the mirror. Remind yourself, say the words out, out loud. This is my responsibility. This is my thesis. This is my research. This is my PhD. Control what you can control. Yes, you can make excuses, but the time's really come for you to reflect on why you are making these excuses. Are you afraid to fail? That's cool. What we're trying to work out is what is being hidden or masked under these excuses. If you can locate what is under an excuse, that is powerful self-knowledge. As Carl Alosk argued, excuses block us from solutions. So we start to speak through offence or frustration or upset. We also start to organise our mental landscape as we're right, we're good, we're proper, nothing's wrong with us at all, and everyone else is wrong and nasty. We're bright people. We can reorganise our mental landscape and provide all sorts of justifications. But that's not healthy for us, let alone the people around us, and creating a culture of achievement. 
When we stop organising our mental landscape in this way, where we're good and perfect and fantastic and everybody else is a problem, then we start to see the potential in other people and the necessity for all of us to continue to grow and continue to learn. Three, make sure that your excuses are not a method for procrastination. Doing research is hard. Doing a PhD is really hard. But are you using excuses as a form of procrastination? So you're rationalising your lack of work, you're rationalising your lack of progress, you're denying your responsibility for your behaviour and you're denying your necessity to change. For example, I've recently had a contact with a student who's been enrolled for a very, 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 very long time. And the characteristic, and there is one, there's a characteristic of students who have been enrolled for a very, very long time. And that is their doctoral narrative, the story that they're telling themselves, is marinated, is punctuated by excuses. So what happens is excuses become the narrative. How can you justify that you're enrolled in a PhD for nine years? How can that ever be justifiable? What, you've had a bad nine years? Really? Really? So we have to get beyond those excuses to get these candidatures concluded. And this particular student's narrative was that they stated they can't write when they're not happy. They can't write when they're not happy. Wow. This is late capitalism. <laughs> If you're waiting until you're happy, you're going to be waiting until you die. The literature also shows that we've currently got a series of problems around the word happiness. And in fact, there are happiness industries and they're hurting us. So why do you think you have a right to be happy? And why do you think that happiness is required to do research? Actually, research requires discipline, precision, and clarity, not happiness. Henrietta Mitchell argued that we live a life through the expectations that we're going to be happy and it's all going to end well. So in other words, those fairy tales we're told as kids have an enormous impact on us. We think there's going to be a happy ending. And so that means because we expect life to be fun and exciting and happy, we procrastinate because life's just not as fun as we thought it would be. So we slow down, we marginalise or we ignore the tough stuff because it's not fun and life's meant to be fun. Actually, life's not pretty, <laughs> life's not fun, life's not happy. It is tough, it is frightening, and it's difficult, and then you die. <laughs> so if you're wanting to feel happy while you're doing your research, you will never do any research. The best research, and no one tells you this, the best research emerges from disappointments and failures. And of course, you look at all the Nobel Prize winners, it's the failures that often triggered the Nobel research. Okay, and speaking of failures, four, here we go, acknowledge failures. One of the reasons excuses emerge is we are conditioned to ignore or minimise failure. Probably comes when we're a kid, so something goes wrong and we know if we acknowledge it, mummy and daddy will be very cross at us. So we learn through primary and secondary socialisation that failures are a problem and there will be consequences if we acknowledge them, right? We always blame other people, so there are no consequences. You see how this culture is formed. But I changed my life a couple of decades ago, 20 years ago now, when I realised that when I admit a mistake, when I admit failure, the world didn't end. And in fact, the world improved. If you notice, I try to always be the first person in the room to acknowledge failure and acknowledge an error. And there are reasons for that. And this might be a useful strategy for you, perhaps. So take it if it fits. But when we acknowledge an error, when we acknowledge failure early, we can stop the self-flagellation, we can stop 
the excuses, and it's also freeing because when we acknowledge a failure, it immediately stops the shaming and the blaming of others. I am responsible. The buck stops with me. And what that acknowledgement does is it creates an immediate freedom that, you know what, we can now do something different. We can behave and act differently. So if we pretend that we haven't made an error, then we'll continue to blame others, make excuses, and we just waste time. We're bright people. We can rationalise just about anything. Give me three data points, I'll give you a story around them. Doesn't mean that it's true, but I can give you a story around them. It's always convenient to be able to change the focus from what we can control and blame other people. So, oh yeah, this happened because those people over there didn't do that. That makes us feel comfortable because we never have to look in the mirror. But instead, there's a power when we take responsibility. A characteristic of successful people is that they acknowledge the mistakes early. They take personal responsibility even if they weren't personally responsible. And they then, at that point, once they've acknowledged the error, behaviour can change. The problem is acknowledged so you can be part of the solution. There are many reasons I don't use excuses. And one is no one cares. Really, no one cares. Because our university sector is irrational and it's toxic. No one cares if you live or die. No one cares if I live or die. We go, oh, we're terribly important. No, we're not. No, we're not. The day after we leave a job, people have forgotten our name. So really, don't big up yourself that you're terribly important. You're really not. Remember, this is, we live in a culture of stretch targets, of, of metrics and outputs. No one cares at all what you feel about those metrics or those outputs or their stretch targets. Don't care. Don't care what you feel. Don't care what you think about them. Don't care about your opinion. Therefore, I deploy what's called radical responsibility. And I first read about the idea of radical responsibility from a truly dreadful book called Now or Never. Oh, it's a terrible book by Preston Smiles and Alexei Panos. Now, dreadful book, but they did have a great section in this book on radical responsibility. Now, I know if a PhD student is going to finish a thesis or not by the language they choose to use with me. So when I'm sitting with them, I monitor very carefully, I take good notes of the language they are deploying as they describe their candidature. And the moment that I hear students blame supervisors or their parents or their partners or their kids or administrators, that's always my personal favourite, you know, you administrators, you administrators, you're responsible for my thesis. Are we? Are we? Really? Okay. Or you blame the university. The university is to blame or you blame your employer. When you have that sort of laundry list of excuses, and that list can be endless, can I say, that's the moment I hear that this person has made other humans responsible for their PhD. And you don't finish a thesis that way. The PhD can be and often is permanently bogged by excuses. So you have to decide. You have to make a choice. You have to make a decision. And what are you choosing? Are you going to choose to be an autonomous, thinking, respectful, responsive scholar? Are you making a decision to manage your time? Are you making a decision to own your choices? Are you making a, a decision to own your decisions? And when you do that, that's when you assume a radical responsibility for your life. Real easy to blame other people, and I understand why you do it, because it lets you off the hook. But it's much harder and much more productive to look in the mirror, take a breath, and claim radical responsibility in your life. 
this is important for your personal life, it's really important for your professional life. And for example, I had a really shocking personal relationship in my early 20s. It was destructive, it was violent, and it was frightening. But I didn't blame him, and I still don't. I blame myself. I blame myself for being naive, for being foolish, and making a bad decision. I am no victim. I am the sum of my decisions. Similarly, when Steve and I, my beloved late husband Steve Reddit and I, left British chairs and went to a new country to take up a job, and within one day, it was clear the dean was out of control, the staff were out of control, it was Lord of the Flies, it was unbelievable. Now, we very easily could have blamed the dean or the university or our colleagues that didn't tell us the truth about the job, but we didn't blame any of those people. We looked at the situation very, very quickly and realised that he'd made a bad decision, I'd made a bad decision, we made a bad decision. We did it. We made a choice and it was a bad choice. So we made a decision to make a better choice and we left. So start to drag back control of your own life. Bad stuff happens to good people. Bad stuff happens to really, really decent people. But you will be judged. Your character will be judged by how you handle the bad stuff in life. All of us make bad choices. All of us. All, I've made some shockers. <laughs> Absolute shockers. All of us make bad choices. But the skill comes, I think, in life, and I'm speaking as a 54-year-old woman. The skill comes in life, I think, in recognising the bad choices and recognising the bad decisions quickly and then making a new decision quickly. If you've made a poor choice, that's okay. Make a decision to make a better choice. Terrific. Brilliant. That's how you change your life. Five. Choose between excuses and progress. Benjamin Franklin once said, quote, I love this, excuses are the tools the incompetent use to build monuments to nothing, end of quote. You're better than that. You are. You're fabulous. You're better than that. Yes, supervisors neglect students. They do. Yes, money is tight. Yes, lab work fails. Yes, there are challenges writing up research, we know that. But control what you can control. Create as much autonomy as you can. And don't confuse a justification with an excuse. Neither, by the way, will help you complete your PhD, but at least a justification has some evidence. An excuse has no evidence. Remove the excuses and do something today. A PhD requires consistency and centeredness. A PhD is a temporary moment in your life. And it's tough because you have to take risks. You have to. You have to make decisions and you have to jump over obstacles. But the way you do this is to park your excuses. Give me one great day then tomorrow morning, give me another great day. These daily actions and daily behaviours move us out of excuse culture and towards a reboot. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.